a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. We're going to be talking about abortion and the dark issues around abortion, not only here in Australia, but also around the world. Of course, you may know that Australia is renowned to have the most liberal abortion laws in the world. And some things that are coming up in the recent Queensland budget, almost $42 million was committed to support the implementation of a new termination of Pregnancy Action Plan 2032, and that's coming over this next five years. Well, the report is peppered with terms like termination care, sexual reproductive health, and women and pregnant people making sexual and reproductive health choices. We'll talk about that sort of terminology as we go through our conversation today. A focus today on where things are heading into a future where abortion is commonplace. Well, our special guest today is a champion of the pro-life cause and has stood firm even though Australian law has been so anti-life Graham Preston has been jailed six times for his Christian pro-life activism. Graham Preston leads Protect Life, while Graham's wife Liz continues to support pregnant women at the Priceless Life Centre in Brisbane. Graham Preston, a special welcome back to 2020. Thank you, Neil. Graham, whenever I say I've been talking to Graham Preston, you know, he's the guy who's the pro-life advocate who has been put into jail six times. People can never believe that there's an Australian who could be jailed six times for standing up for a pro-life position. But this is your story. Yes, that's correct. What's the longest stint you spent in prison? Uh, Eight months. And these are because you had been breaking the law... Uh, standing on a street corner, holding up a sign. Um, oh, it was not quite just simple as that. We were involved with sit-ins in front of the doors of the abortion clinics. So we were on the property of the abortion clinics and sitting in front of the doors. And uh, this has always been peaceful. Oh, yes. Uh, but the accusations would be that somehow or other there you're there to derail people in their lives and all sorts of things. No doubt all sorts of terminology makes it sound very sinister. Ah, oh, yes, that's right. Uh, they made us look as bad as possible, but uh, we were simply there to say that uh, uh, we would put ourselves between the abortionist and their intended victim, the unborn baby. And even one of the cases went to the High Court. Yes, we, uh, when laws were introduced to ban people from being within 150 metres of an abortion clinic expressing any opposition or offering any help to women going to those places. Uh, I believed it was necessary that that should be challenged and Tasmania was the first state of Australia that introduced such a law and so uh, I went there and uh, once the law had been passed I stood in front of the abortion clinic in Hobart and uh, was arrested uh, subsequently convicted, fined three thousand dollars, and uh, we decided to challenge the law by taking it to the high court, which we did. Uh, unfortunately, we lost, and the high court found that it was legitimate to suppress freedom of speech out on the streets of uh, our cities, and uh, it is now a criminal offence with up to twelve months jail if anybody is perceived to be saying anything in opposition to abortion within 150 metres of abortion clinics, and that's now all around Australia. We won't get into a really uh, big discussion around this, but I do need to ask you, uh, when you're a Christian and you've been convicted and you've been sent to jail because you've been standing there for Christ or sitting in, as the case may be, and doing that in the name of Christ. You're driven by your Christian convictions. Uh, Sometimes we hear stories about how prisoners are received behind bars, uh, and some get pretty rough treatment. What sort of reaction do you get from prisoners uh, when they hear that you've been convicted because you're standing up for the unborn? Yeah, well, it's been mixed. Uh, Jail is a very unpredictable place, Uh, 
things happen there not necessarily because of any logical reasons. Uh, people often suffering from mental health problems and uh, and so it is very hard to predict how any individual will respond to you. Uh, on a couple of occasions, men had threatened me with violence, but nothing ever happened. But very often also, the men were astonished and had considerable respect. I remember one particular occasion, each unit always had the toughest guys that nobody messed with, and there were two fellows in this unit. One was from Northern Ireland, and um, the other guy, I don't know where he was from, but uh, they kept pretty much to themselves, but uh, nobody would... Uh, would uh, do anything against them. And uh, one day I was sitting at a table playing a game of chess with another fellow and one of the Irishmen walked up to me and he said, uh, are you the guy here that's in here because you're opposed to abortion? And I said, uh, I thought, well, I wonder what's going to happen now. And I said, yes. And he said, oh, I just want to shake your hand. So, you know, things like that were pretty uh, encouraging. Well, listeners might have a question to ask you and I uh, don't want to stop anyone from exploring that avenue because it certainly demonstrates a level of courage to stand for your convictions uh, that is so rare. You are the man who has that image, a courageous uh, man who will stand up for the unborn and uh, a very significant thing. And let's talk about the chaos that is going on around the world. So many people have noticed that there's so many things in the world going astray, going wrong, uh, getting twisted right now. I wonder whether we might start off with your impressions about what's going on in a global sense around attitudes to abortion. Uh, Where do we start here, Graham? Well, uh, probably the most significant thing that's happened this year is in France a few months ago, earlier this year, uh, they made abortion a constitutional right. It's the first country in the world to do so, and that's a very significant thing. I mean, really, something like abortion has nothing to do with a country's constitution. That's not what constitutions are normally about. But they did. They introduced that, and uh, to the extent where they might even make it illegal for a person to oppose abortion. And so it's quite extraordinary, and it wasn't as if it just just passed, it was uh, 10 to 1 the vote was in favour of it becoming part of their constitution. And so uh, for a country to do that and then to commit themselves to seeing that happen in countries around the world, they said quite explicitly they want to see other countries do that, do this. And so I think there will be pressure in other places, including in Australia, perhaps to see that also made a constitutional right. I don't know how your uh, depth of understanding the detail is in France, uh, but when we talk about Australia having the most liberal abortion laws and abortion right up to birth here in Australia, uh, when they're voting to have abortion enshrined in their constitution, do their laws rival ours for severity? Uh, I I couldn't be too specific on that, but, um, I mean, pretty much that's the case that uh, I don't think there's many places now, well... There's other places that have gone like Australia and liberalised abortion like we have up to birth. And uh, and so, yes, the attitude generally is uh, respect for the life of the child in the womb. It seems to be diminishing around the world. Come back, before we start to uh, explore some other areas here, uh, the fact that we are Christians having this conversation uh, there is a Christian position. doesn't matter whether you're uh, Protestant or Catholic. Uh, we all have the same biblical foundation that, you know, God is the author of life. We haven't got the right to take it in the way that abortionists are doing so. Uh, one of the most significant scriptures that I know you are proud to use is from Proverbs 24, verse 11. Rescue those being led away to death. I wonder if you've got a reflection here on Christians and our attitude to abortion, because it's very easy to be swept along with a worldly uh, sense of, you know, oh, <laughs> women's uh, uh, health rights and things like that. But what are your thoughts here for Christians and the way we hold a pro-life position? Yes, it's very true that uh, it is easy to be influenced by the the attitudes of the world on this subject and increasingly more challenging to be able to make that stand because once it has been legalised, as it has been in Australia, it's influential in people's thinking that, well, if it's legal, maybe it's okay after all. 
and uh, I think you need to have a very clear and strong position of your own about what the value of human life is to resist that and not just uh, be swept along with that thinking. And so, yes, we need to be very clear in our minds as Christians as to what the value of life is and uh, and not just simply hold that as a, a theory but actually see in practice, well, what does that mean? Can we just live quietly and say, yes, it's wrong, and just live with that, or do we need to be willing to speak up and do something about it? And as the world liberalises and slides along that slippery slope into very dark futures around the issue of abortion, uh, come back to France here for a few moments, because as I understand it, uh, putting abortion rights in the Constitution uh, and the thought that that makes it even more accepted than uh, just having it legislated. Uh, but it seems to be that the French, uh, they've done this so that other countries will follow them because everyone wants to have others think that what they've done is right. Yeah, and uh, that is a, a, a real concern that uh, that their, what they have done will influence the thinking of other nations and um, it would be even worse if we were to make it a constitutional right elsewhere, yes. Uh, any, I mean, are people talking about this in Australia? I mean, I haven't uh, heard it mentioned, but no. that's not to say that it hasn't been talked about, no. Let's take some calls. Let's first of all hear from Natalie in Camp Mountain in Queensland. Hey, Natalie, welcome. Hi, thanks, Neil and Graham. Yeah, uh, enjoying your conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just have a, I don't know if it's a question or a point, uh, definitely pro-life here. I've got 10 grandchildren. I, I adore babies, you know, all of that. Uh, and you shouldn't harm a baby as far as I'm concerned or a child at any time. Um, and we have been very personally and directly involved with adoptions. We have three adopted children from Ethiopia and we have also been involved with foster care. So I do speak from a, a little bit of knowledge. Um, I know lots of stories of young girls who would have liked to have their babies adopted out but you almost can't, well not in Queensland and so if we're going to talk about not aborting babies for some, in some situations we also need to talk about the adoption issue so please don't abort your baby but have it adopted but you can't in Queensland, it's almost not impossible Natalie you raise a really good point Graham you might have some general thoughts around the things that Natalie's sharing but especially on this adoption issue what are your thoughts for Natalie yes well it is very true that uh, very few babies uh, end up being available for adoption in Queensland and uh, it is it's it's a terrible thing that um, women are told to either abort or uh, keep a baby perhaps in single motherhood and so on which is not always an you know, ideal situation uh, but adoption is is regarded as the worst thing you can do and which is just a really terrible thing there are many couples who do want to adopt but uh, babies just are not available to to be able to do so and so yes this certainly needs to change the attitude towards adoption uh, while we've got Natalie on the phone, are there any campaigns that have run in the past uh, or that might be something for the future around uh, the pro-life movement uh, pushing for uh, some better adoption laws? Oh, well, the pro-life movement has always been very supportive of adoption and uh, it's it's more a um, the social services that have this attitude that... Uh, no, you can't mm. do that. That That's just no good for your baby to put them up for adoption. And so it needs to be a, a change in mentality more than anything. And uh, But certainly politically, it, yes, they should be f compelled to make them available for adoption and not talked out of it. Natalie in Camp Mountain in Queensland, thank you so much for a great question, great contribution. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. Let's take a few more calls here. Vince is in Brisbane. Hey, Vince, welcome. Hi, Neil. Yeah, yeah. hi, Graham. Hello. Graham, look, I, I just want to compliment first up your, your, your courage there, you know, being jailed six times, eight months for the longest term. Um, I, you know, I find that, I find that amazing. Um, yeah, anyway, anyway um, but, but something uh, I want to mention, you mentioned the French Constitution. Now, they, 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 they put it into the French Constitution, that right, and they reminded me what was going on in Paris with the Olympics. 
you know, like the, I, I know it's not directly related, but like the you know the mocking of God. Yes, and I know I saw an image of the pale rider too, like from like from the apocalypse, from Revelation. There, it it to me all ties into like a whole glo- you know globalist um, demonic agenda. Yes, well, the mockery yeah. of the Last Supper as well. I don't know if you saw that. I, yeah. Yeah. It was just crazy. Yeah. And that might be reflective of the very heavily secularised society in France and uh, almost to the point where art becomes enlarged by a mockery of religious things, but uh, especially Christianity. And and in some sense here, Christianity is at the focus of when these uh, abortion laws come in because it's Christians who are standing firm saying, no, don't abort those babies. Uh, anything further from you, Graham? Well, yeah, I mean, and this is the, the thing that the Christian community must maintain, their clear opposition to abortion and not just let this... Uh, fade away over time, we must be clear and remain clear that as Christians we regard abortion as wrong and the life of the human child in the womb must be respected and that must be clear that the community knows that and that we haven't changed our attitude. Vince in Brisbane, thank you so much for your call. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. Let's take another one. Cole is in Western Australia. Hey, Cole, welcome. How you going, mate? Good, good, Cole. What are your thoughts? Yeah, okay. I I just wanted to say thank you, Graham. You're a legend, mate. You're you're tough as nails, and God needs more like you. And God bless you, brother, because, like, since time began, thousands of years ago, Satan hates children, and he wants to kill them. And that's pretty much all I've got to say is just God bless you, mate. Thanks. And even if you go to prison, mate, People are going to look after you, you know? Like the Lord's always got your back, you know? Yeah, Thank- God bless you, man. You're Thanks. a real man. A real man. Thank you, Cole. You take care. <laughs> Cole in WA, thank you so much for your call. And, uh, you know, uh, this is an interesting element here. Cole's delivering it in the way that Aussies really typically think. Tough as nails. Uh, this is what a real man does. Uh, Because there might be some men who are thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to put my own future, my own safety on the line to protect uh, unborn babies. But you've gone and done just that. And and in some sense here, you've become something of a role model, Uh, Graham. Just anything else just to on touch, just to touch on that as we top that uh, that off? Well, I'm not really a tough guy at all, I can assure you. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I think we just have to have our convictions and be prepared to stand by them. And uh, you don't have to be a tough person. You just have to believe what you believe and uh, be willing to trust God. Well, we'll accept your humility here, but I know the listeners are thinking this guy is truly a tough guy. Uh, you have stood your ground and you have not backed down. Hey, let's take another call. Eugene is in Perth in WA. Hey, Eugene. Hey, Graham, Graham, how are you? Hi, fine. What are your thoughts, Eugene? I I think in regards to the abortion laws, especially in WA, um, it's very, in most states, it's very liberalized. But I think um, part of the problem is that as, as it's, I think it's wrapped around, I heard a lot of things about women's rights or women's choice. And I think... The mentality needs to change um, to more, uh, um, not just a women's right, but I think, I think the I think the scripture says very clearly um, that it's more, it's more, it's more like a husband and a wife thing more than more than just the women's right or women's or or. Oh, yeah. Eugene, you're making a good point here. Uh, is it just women who are responsible for a new generation of those babies being born? Or is this something that husbands and wives ought to be responsible for? Uh, your thoughts here for Eugene, Graham? Oh, well, yes. I mean, I am out on the streets all the time and uh, probably the main criticism I get from people in the community is, oh, you're a man, you shouldn't have any comment about this. But I always just point out to them, well, every child does have a father. And uh, in all of this, the, the father's concern for their child is c- completely overlooked uh, because a father cannot stop 
uh, the mother of the child from having an abortion. He's no legal rights, and um, it's not as it's as if they don't even exist. And uh, of course, it is the woman that carries the child, but certainly a father is involved in the creation of that child. And so we believe that men have every right and responsibility to speak up on behalf of the children just as much as, as the woman does. Uh, Eugene in Perth, thanks so much for your call. We'll take more calls after Vision National News. Just a minute or so just to touch on what I mentioned in the introduction. Uh, in the state of Queensland, what's called the Termination of Pregnancy Action Plan 2032 over the next five years. Um, a quick little uh, overview here, Graham, on, on what's happening in Queensland. It's uh, it's just one of those things, more slippery slope here. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it seems incredible that uh, after making abortion available up to birth that uh, the pro-abortion lobby would have had everything that they want. But now the government is providing another $42 million to uh, provide what they call more termination care. And, you know, that's a complete oxymoron to talk about care when you're killing a child is is just ludicrous. But um, the government is committed to meeting the sexual reproductive health needs of women and pregnant people. And that just says it all of the mentality of the way our society is thinking, talking about pregnant uh, women and pregnant people. Uh, it, it's it's just the abuse of language in all of this. But, um, no, they're throwing money around like confetti. They've got um, $20 million committed to enhancing the termination of pregnancy workforce, $10 million to establishing contemporary models of care, $8 million to supporting non-government organisations to provide wraparound termination of pregnancy support, and on it goes. So money seems to be no object. They just uh, want to make abortion more and more easily available. Doesn't seem to worry them at all. We'll talk some more about that after news. Graham Preston is our guest. Before we take any more calls, though, Graham, let me ask you, because talking about this uh, new bill for Queensland, what's the reaction from all the different partners in abortion been in this abortion space in the state of Queensland? Well, it's not so much a bill. It's just... uh money allocated in the budget to this uh, new abortion action plan. But uh, groups that you would hope wouldn't support such a thing are, for example, Alison Weatherstone, the chief midwife of the Australian College of Midwives, had this to say about it. The Australian College of Midwives acknowledges Queensland Health's work to ensure equity and access for Queensland women for termination of pregnancy services in particular for midwives and nurse practitioners to prescribe MS two-step, which is the abortion pill. This is a win for women's health in Queensland. Now, you know, I just find that incredible that the head of the midwives group college would be willing to endorse this, that uh, the very thing that you would think midwives are, are concerned for is the health and protection of the child in the womb and their delivery, they are promoting and encouraging the killing of the babies in the womb. Then you have the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists who said they are pleased to continue being involved in the improvement of abortion care in Queensland. Uh, You know, what is this that obstetricians and gynecologists want to promote abortion? It's, It's really disgusting. Okay, and listeners might have their own thoughts to add to that. A question, a comment, as I said earlier, even a critique for our conversation. Our talkback line's open, 1-800-316-316. want to get on to things that are happening, say, in the US as well, but let's take a call first. Bernadette is in Kingston in South Australia. Hey, Bernadette, welcome. Hi, Hi Neil. Hi, Hi, Graham. Look, I just want to commend Graham for what he's doing. Very brave just to keep going. And as a woman, you know, I, as I just want to protect life and I think abortion's shocking and I think the laws are dreadful and I think he's so brave standing up. He's like a little David standing up against Goliath. And good on you for what you're doing, Graham. I, I highly commend you for what you're doing, taking taking on the Goliath that's coming against you. But, you know, I, I just know no matter what you're going through, God will give you the strength to keep going. And I just say keep going because God is with you and you're going to succeed. No matter what's happening, you're making an impact. Where the, where the, you know, It doesn't matter how things look, you're making an impact around you and that's why 
because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, James won the victory. And so the light in you is pushing back the darks, and that's why there's a reaction. So just keep going because you're doing a terrific job and you're like little David and Goliath. Remember, David won against the Goliath, so you're, you're going to win, mate. <laughs> just want to encourage you. Doing Thanks, Brother Dad. Job. Appreciate that's your right. encouragement. And, uh, okay. yes, I hope it encourages others to do the same. Yeah, no worries. Keep going. Keep Thank you. Going. You're doing a terrific job. Bernadette, you make a great cheerleader and uh, words of encouragement, I'm sure, uh, not falling on the sort of ears that don't take that to heart. And uh, I think even Graham Preston, having been jailed six times, uh, needs to have those words of encouragement. Bernadette, thank you so much for your call. Hey, let's get a little insight uh, around what's going on in the United States because Of course, there's an election on. I call it an election circus. There's a lot of stunts. There's a lot of all sorts of uh, exciting things, hard to turn away from. Um, But, you know, what happens in the U.S. does send ripples around the world. And abortion is right front and center uh, insofar as candidates who will be standing for election as president. And I wonder if you've got any thoughts about, uh, you know, whether there's one side better than another in the U.S., Graham. Yeah, well, unfortunately... uh it's a very mixed bag in America in, in, in individuals and within the parties and so on. And uh, the Republican Party in America, which is part of their platform since 1984 and had strong statements against abortion, have completely removed that now. Uh, Donald Trump himself is a very mixed bag personally on the whole issue. And sometimes he seems to indicate he's opposed to abortion. On other times, he seems to be quite weak about it. So he's a very mixed person. He doesn't seem to so much speak from personal principle but from pragmatism and uh, what he thinks is going to get him votes. He seems to be going back and forth like that. His new um, running mate for vice president uh, is also giving mixed messages, uh, on the one hand saying he's against abortion but at the same time saying he's willing to accept the use of the abortion pill. Uh, which doesn't make any sense at all because the abortion pill is now the means by which most abortions are done. So uh, that that is really confusing. But then on the other side, uh, well, Joe Biden, as we know, is now gone, and he was pro-abortion. But uh, Kamala Harris, who's replaced him as the Democrat running uh, candidate, she's even worse, and uh, she's very, very pro-abortion. And so if she were to get in as president... Um, If it could be made worse, she'd make it worse. Okay, there's not good news on either side uh, for Americans there, as you say, uh, when you've got a softening on the Republican side and uh, a weakening of their own, uh, what was a pro-life stance, now no longer as pro-life as it was. And uh, there might even be listeners who uh, will be able to remember, I mean, some things from the earlier term of a Donald Trump Uh, who was around pro-life issues very strong. But as you say, they've removed that from uh, their their policy foundations. uh, That that would be concerning, wouldn't it, uh, when you think that there is some sort of clear-cut difference here, but there's not necessarily. No, they've certainly weakened it, and the pro-lifers in America are very, very disturbed by that change that they have had, considering how the uh, pro-lifers have supported the Republican Party in the past, but now the party's just turning their back on them. And uh, nobody knows yet who uh, Kamala Harris's running mate will be for vice president, Uh, but you mentioned the uh, vice president running with Donald Trump, uh, the candidate, uh, of course, uh, J.D. Vance. Um, He has some Catholic foundations. Uh, It tends to be people who have some Catholic foundations are often, they're characterised by being pro-life. So when you've got people who have... Uh, their religious heritage, and all of a sudden they don't hold to their religious heritage anymore. That's that's a, it's almost a, hip, a, a hypocritical statement, isn't it? Well, yes, and uh, but it all seems to be about getting power. And if they think there's going to be more votes going one way than the other, principles seem to go out the window. So uh, unfortunately, that seems to be so much typical politics. All right. Uh, Anything else around the world? Uh, When you've got to US, we've talked about uh, France. um, Here in Australia, the developments in Queensland. I wonder if you've got any thoughts, any updates on on things that are changing, because I actually do want to get on to the thing that we've been sort of talking about. But 
People very, very often don't uh, talk about the seriousness of the abortion pills uh, that are sent through the mail and people are having abortions at home. And in some sense, it can look like you've got some abortion wins uh, if there are clinics and such things closing down, but but people are just accessing abortions in different ways. And that actually, uh, even potentially, uh, makes things even snowball all the more, don't they? Ah, yes. This is certainly something to be very concerned about, the way in which uh, the take-up of the abortion pill is increasing. Uh, here in Queensland now, there are 132 medical, ordinary medical practices, suburban medical practices in towns around the state that now provide the abortion pill, 132 places. And I would encourage listeners around the country to check with the medical practice that you attend and ask them, do you provide the abortion pill to those people who ask for it? And uh, if they do, find somewhere else to go because doctors need to realise that people do not just accept one patient being given an abortion pill and then the next one who wants uh, antenatal care being given that. We need to say, no, you just don't provide means to, to kill babies. Even if it is just a simple thing of giving people pills, it still takes the life of an unborn child. And so, yes, it is It is uh, a uh, trend that is very disturbing that um, uh, so many abortions now are being done by means of a pill. Stay with pills for a moment here. As you say, I mean, you can have the abortion in a clinic and uh, there's a certain brutality about that. It even seems to soften it uh, when a pill arrives in the mail. It's been prescribed by a doctor, perhaps even on a telehealth call. I'm not even sure how exactly all that works, but the ultimate end result is just as brutal because a life is lost. Well, many people would say it is worse for the woman herself because uh, when she has a surgical abortion, she's got at least partial uh, anesthesia, so she's not fully experiencing it. It's all over in a a matter of half an hour, Uh, so it is relatively quick. Compared to the use of the pill, which takes a couple of days for the whole procedure, she normally will deliver the child herself sitting on the toilet. Uh, She may see the, the small child. Um, and so for her, and, and just physically for the woman, some women have very, very negative experiences physically from using the abortion pill. And so uh, many people would say it, it is even more of a negative effect on women than a surgical abortion is. And so it sounds like a very simple thing. I'll just take a couple of pills, and that's, I think, the attraction Uh, but the actual effect on people and and the end result is a dead child either way. But uh, So that's the worst aspect of it. It still kills a child, but uh, uh, the negative effects on the women can be very, very dramatic. In fact, they can be lasting lifelong as psychological difficulties and challenges and regrets uh, that women face when they have actually gone through an abortion. Um, and this, in some sense, uh, your wife Liz is in the middle of the mix on that uh, with uh, the uh, the pregnancy help that she provides. Uh, she's right there in amongst the mix and uh, deals with a lot of these sorts of issues like a like a PTSD that on, is ongoing through the rest of your life. Yes, as well as helping run the group um, um, uh, Price's House, she also helps run a group called Hope Alive, which... It, helps women who have uh, lost children through either miscarriage or through abortion and so on. And so she sees women who and men as well for whom this is a, a devastating thing and, uh, and as you said, it can last a lifetime, uh, a burden that women carry that uh, they know what they have done and it, it doesn't go away. And so we would encourage anybody who has had an abortion to, to look up Hope Alive and uh, seek the counsel and support that they provide. It's a Christian-based uh, counselling uh, program that is, is very helpful. Taking calls on one 316 316 Let's hear from Julie in Ballarat in Victoria. Hey, Julie, welcome. Oh, oh thank you. Um, um, and if I can get it said without crying because it's obviously a very... A uh, very special uh, topic that you're talking about. As a nurse, I worked in a theatre uh, where they um, obviously would have terminations and 
just when you're saying there about how it was surgically they don't feel it. I noticed that when, um, and I, I wasn't a volunteer to work in those those theatre rooms, but they, those cases would be put before me and I'd have to deal with what had to be done. But when I was in the recovery room, when those girls were, when those girls were waking up that before they were even conscious enough to say their name, they'd be crying. Yeah. So there's a sense of even for when they do. Sorry. When they've had that termination, there's something in them that they must know. Sorry, that they must know. And they'd be crying before they'd be barely awake. And I'd just be praying that somehow God would touch their lives and let them know how much He loves them. And I'd just be quietly praying while I'm doing the recovery process and doing their odds and just and asking Jesus to come into their life somehow to just heal that hurt and only what He can touch deep within their spirit. So I just wanted to say that even in the surgical side of it, they would always be crying when they'd wake up. I uh, wish your story could go out widely so everybody could hear that because, yes, oh, that, that really is important that people know that. that uh, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, there's no way you can kill a child without it hurting you. And the, oh, There's something, obviously something in their spirit, in their psyche, they, 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 that they recognise that they can't put possibly words to it, but it's there. And, and when you see it um, in the different reactions of uh, people I've cared for, you just... Yeah, all we can do is just keep praising God for them and ask Jesus to touch them in such a way that can reveal the truth of how much He loves them, how much He forgives them, how much you know what He paid for us on the cross. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, I just need to say yeah, that. Well, thank Julie, you for letting us know. Thank you. And uh, while we've got you here, I mean, when we talk about you know the victim in an abortion is a baby's life lost. Uh, but the way you're describing this, uh, the victim in an abortion also is the mother, uh, and oftentimes she's been coerced into being where she's at. And so the emotional turmoil that accompanies the abortion, uh, there's an awful lot of dimensions in there. And uh, I wonder, Graham, the dimensions, I mean, this coercion, the challenges that women face, uh, the unexpected accidental uh, pregnancy, those sorts of things, these are very, very hard for people to deal with. Oh, yes, and the worst thing is that once it's become normalised that the inhibitions that people would have had in the past uh, are, are largely removed because now they think, well, it is legal and you can get it in a public hospital, so maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. And this is how insidious it all is that the natural instinct that the woman and the parents have that this is their child, we should not harm them, we should look after them and care for them, that's just being overridden and people thinking, well, I, I, I will do it. But then they have to live with it and they cannot deny what they have done. No. Julie, anything more to add? Oh, look, it's, look, look as we know, every life is valuable because God gives, them, gives us our next breath. And, uh, and, you know, just knowing that he's the creator of our next breath and for everyone who breathes, it's just he's our creator and only he knows and determines when that last breath will be taken, whatever age. And if only oh, the power of the choice that God gives us that people could choose to just ask him, okay, God, how much do you love me? You know, if you're God and, and you're a God of love, how much do you love me? I want to know you for myself so that, you know, we can live out with each breath that you give us your your steps, Lord, your thinking, your heartbeat of love, your truth, your victory, your joy. <laughs> He's just an amazing God, <laughs> So wonderful. He loves yeah. everybody, but not everybody knows that. Yes. And if we could just uh, remind people that every life is valuable, but not every choice is valuable. So if we can yeah. just um, come back to Lord and say, okay, Lord, help me make life building choices. Yes. Julie, oh, thanks so much for calling in and uh, just sharing your first. Uh, first frontline uh, experience around these issues and uh, women who are on that waking up uh, trauma that they have faced. Julie in Ballarat, thank you so much for thank your you. call. Uh, let's take, it uh, looks like we've got Eugene back with us from WA. Hey, Eugene. Hi. Just a quick question. Um, in Australia, I've read somewhere that we got a... Uh, um, um, our birth rates have plummeted. I was just wondering, um, probably, and we have very high migration, 
I was wondering instead of focusing on on I think I think part of the problem is 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 that we're not look we're not looking after um vulnerable of the children and instead we're bringing in more and more people um from overseas so that's that's the tail end of where we are in Australia. Uh, Eugene, I'm not exactly sure that uh, direction that you're leading us in here for response, but uh, so well, far as migration goes and attitudes changing. Well, I mean, certainly as far as the birth rate goes, part of the reason why it is has gone as low as it is, and I think it's down to a record low now, uh, is because of the high abortion rate we have. I mean, uh, estimated perhaps 100,000 abortions a year in Australia and only 200-something odd uh, are births. So or maybe 300,000, not quite sure. Uh, but uh, if those babies weren't being aborted, our, our birth rate would be above replacement level and there mightn't be such a thought that we need to have so many migrants come because um, our population would be being replaced by natural births. So certainly the abortion rate is affecting uh, the number of births in this country, obviously, and uh, affecting attitudes perhaps towards immigration as well. Eugene, thanks so much for your call. And uh, time's almost running out, Graham. Um, is there a way, is there any campaign that you're aware of around the issues of uh, what's happening in the state of Queensland uh, around, you know, the, the money that's been allocated in the budget, $41.8 million to support the implementation of a new Termination of Pregnancy Action Plan 2032. Sounds like it's ideologically driven. Is there any campaigns that you're aware of uh, around that? Well, I mean, that's money that's already been allocated in the budget. So I don't think, uh, unless there's a change of government, the uh, new government might uh, change that allocation of money Um but uh, I wouldn't hold my breath too much as to what the if the uh, there were a change of government in Queensland when the elections held later this year, uh, they haven't made any commitments or promises about the whole abortion issue. They don't seem to want to talk about it at all. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think one of the things I would encourage people to think is don't think that the politicians are going to do it all for us. Uh, unless they are confident that this is what the community wants to see, sing, see things change, very few politicians are going to go out on a limb on this issue. And so it is up to us, all of us listening today, to be willing to make a stand, speak up, encourage our churches to speak up, to to do whatever we can to keep this issue alive. Because as time goes by, uh increasingly people are just learning to accept it and live with it and we must say well no we're not going to just live with this we're not going to be silent and just stand aside and let it continue to happen and so I encourage everybody to to see that we all have a role to play and uh, not just simply think that the politicians are going to do it. We all have uh, potentially people who are in our sphere of influence might be our family it might be in our street, could be in our local church. Some of us have louder voices than others, but uh, to be able to stand up and be openly pro-life, certainly driven by the foundation that we have in our Christian faith. Uh, Graham, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I like to encourage people uh, you know, maybe you want to join Graham on the street. Uh, you're renowned for standing on a street corner and holding up a sign and engaging people in conversations. Uh, you wouldn't mind a, an extra friend or two from time to time? Oh, certainly. And it uh, doesn't matter where you live. You don't have to be in Brisbane where I am. Uh, uh, you can get a hold of uh, a picture of an unborn baby and uh, a suitable sign to go with it and just be there uh, when people are around to to make them think because that's the thing that our society wants to do, just to sweep this under the carpet, pretend it's not happening, but it's up to us to shine a light on what is going on and be advocates for the unborn. Even when people oppose us for doing that, we must be willing to do it. Well, you've been courageous enough, Graham Preston, uh, to do six stints in jail because you stand up for pro-life causes, uh, anti-abortion, and uh, you're courageous enough to even stand on the street 
and uh, take some of the abuse that is often hurled at you. And we've had conversations about those uh, sorts of experiences that you've had before. But I want to honour you and thank you for taking some time to share these thoughts with listeners today. Let me just point listeners to how they can connect with you. And you might want to write this down, protect-life.info. That's the website where you can follow along with Graham Preston and uh, all of the things that he's doing with Protect Life. And also Liz, Graham's wife, uh, she uh, leads the Priceless Life Centre in the city of Brisbane. There's a website there too, pricelesslife.org, pricelesslife.org. Graham Preston, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your heart with us once again today on 2020. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.